Good evening everyone and thank you for joining us for this Dairy Co webinar tonight. Um, my name is Debbie McConnell, Research and Development Manager here at Dairy Co and I will be chairing our session this evening. So over the last 18 months or so, Dairy Co have been working with both farmers and our industry partners to update the existing Economic Breeding Index, PLI, and to introduce our new Spring Calving Index, um, which is specific to spring calving herds making extensive use of grass. These indices were launched earlier on this week and I am really delighted to bring you tonight's uh, webinar on making the most of genetics and introduction uh, to these new indexes with uh, Mr. Marco Winters, our head of genetics for Derico. So over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, Marco is going to run through his presentation. Um, so without further ado, Marco, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you Debbie for the introduction and good evening everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, as Debbie has already introduced the topic. Uh, I guess I, I won't go over it again, but you will be aware that we have had some changes at the beginning of this week when we launched our new uh, spring calving index and the revised PLI. And really tonight what I want to do in the next 25 minutes is, is just go over some of the, the reasons why we've made the changes uh, and also then show you the impact of the changes that it's having. And at the end, as Debbie said, uh, it, it then be some opportunities to ask some questions if, if anything isn't clear yet. So first of all, I guess, why do we need a PLI at all? Uh, PLI, the Profitable Lifetime Index, has been around in the UK for quite some time now. And it is an index, really, to allow farmers to make selection in bulls a lot easier. Because if you think about uh, the genetic indexes that we now have available, we have about 35 different traits. So there's a, a lot of choice out there. But it also means there's a lot of opportunity for confusion for the individual farmer who may not be that interested in genetics, and I guess the fact that you're uh, well, online at the moment and made the effort to join us, I guess you're probably not one of those. You probably understand the indices, but there's enough farmers out there who really are looking for an, an easy guide to say, well, which are the bulls that I should be looking at? And really, the, the, the main difficulty is that when we've got 35 different traits, it's the relative importance of these sometimes isn't all that clear. And it makes it very time consuming to study and balance these traits. So really, PLI is out there to make a simpler guide. It, it doesn't mean that we're just going to say, just use number one, two, and three. I think the, the choice is there for individual farmers. Also, I, I guess we are aware, obviously, that these goals are evolving. And if you think just about the past in the UK, how selection has changed from traditional dual purpose to production only indices, really the fitness update that we had in 2007 with PLI was a, a major shift already in the direction that we're continuing today. And I guess that's the, the bit that I will be sharing with you tonight, and you may have read about it in the press previously. Also, really, what, when we are talking about genetics, it's not just a, a theoretical number. We've also done research when we looked at some ProMar study in 2011. There's about 400 herds that we looked at the financial uh, evaluations on the farm compared to the genetics of the herds. And we already illustrated then that really PLI does have a very strong correlation to profitability. And, and really, it's significant in, in terms of choosing the right genetics going forward. And that's also why it is so important that we get this PLI index right. And I guess it has been successful. And certainly, um, I'm not going to talk you through all the traits, but I'm just going to show you in one slide uh, three key traits, I guess, just to indicate how things have changed. And, and the first one I want to show you here, uh, just to, to make you aware that the data that I'm showing here is based on insemination data that we collect through milk recordings, so CIS, NMR, and UDF in Northern Ireland. And that data is then summarized to say, well, how are farmers selecting bulls, and really what's the genetic progress that we're observing? So the blue line that I'm looking at here, or the blue bars, is the, the gains that we've made in milk production since 95 up until 2014. And you can see that as selection has continued, there's always been an upward trend for production trades, and that, and that continues to go up. The bit that may... Um, stand out to you is really when we look at some of these bars here, you see some drops, and that's every year we see a, a blip coming through, and those are really our spring calving herds, and we know that those select different types of genetics than, than typically uh, for, the, for the all year round calving herds or August or autumn calving herds. If you then look at the, the lifespan trends, you can see that initially there was a, a decline in lifespan up until about 2000, when we really put a significant effort in the UK in terms of improving the, the lifespan animal. And really, you can see that that is now an upward trend and continues to go up at the moment, and, and there's no slow, slowing down on that one. When we then look at the fertility index, that's a, a slightly different story. That was really showing a very negative trend. 
up until 2007, and this is really when the, we changed the PLI at the last time in 2007 and put a significant emphasis on improving fertility. And as a consequence, we can see that really we are now in a very steady upward trend, and the genetics being used today is similar to really what we were using in the 90s. And I guess this success is something that we want to build on and certainly isn't something we want to deviate from. And in fact, I think it's a, it is a very success, uh, good success story of the UK that, that we should be proud of. Then two other traits, I guess, that's also uh, significant when we talk about um, functional type traits. When we look at the, the genetic progress being made in udders and food and legs, that also is showing a very strong improvement since 95 up until today. And again, you, you may see these blips coming through where our spring calving herds are having a slightly different selection emphasis on, on type versus the, the traditional herds, if you like. And what it all means in terms of profitability is really we, we can see that things have improved, but you can also see that in the 90s, for a very long time, we really were flatlining. So even though we were making significant gains in production, we weren't really tackling the cost. So when you talk about longevity or fertility, and it seems we've, we've now included those into the, the overall indices that we can see a steady improvement going forward. Now, the reason I'm showing you some of the black and white animals there is for two reasons, I guess, is to remind myself that really when I'm talking about these trends, uh, we are looking at Holstein uh, data, and that is still about 90% of the, the insemination records that we're collecting. But also, I guess, it is, it is illustrating that really in the UK, we have made significant progress. And from being a, a big importer of genetics, we are really now the stock um, well, I guess there's a lot of people looking at the UK, and certainly we can be proud of the genetics that we're offering in terms of females and males. So what is it then that we're going to look for? Well, really, in terms of um, breeding, we are looking way ahead. It's not just what's going to happen tomorrow. We've got to be thinking about what's happening in 5, 10, or 15 years from now. And we all know that really the world is changing, and that does also mean there's a different type of cow that's needed for the future. So that's really the starting point, I guess, that's, that we've been focusing on to say, OK, what do we need? And, and as part of that, we update the PLI. And this has been a, a project that started in May 2013. So it's really been a 12 to 18 months project to where we are today. It's based on uh, science that was developed by SRUC in Edinburgh and also Evacus Bio, a company in New Zealand who's focused on genetics and, and economics. And together with those two research centers, we've developed an economic model but well, we can now attribute economic values to every trade that we're interested in. And that model in itself is something like 350 input variables. So it's a, it's a complex model, but it does also mean that really the output of it can be, can be trusted and can be used. Now, in terms of data going into it, there's obviously a lot going in. Uh, and we do work very closely with our industry partners. Uh, specifically there, you can see the logos of the, the breed society and milk recording companies who contribute also to the data for the genetic evaluations and are, are critical in the whole process. But in the development of PLI and the spring calving index, we did also dwell on or try to get information from the industry as much as possible. And two specifically I want to mention here is the eGene's technical advisory group. That's really our genetic evaluations technical advisory group. We look after the, the scientific and technical interest. Uh, but more importantly, possibly, is the genetics advisory forum, which is a, a dairy co forum that's uh, made up of farmers, AI companies, herd books, milk recording, also as a representative from RSPCA, because uh, we also do know that as an industry, we have to engage and, and really well share what we are doing. Uh, and then finally, geneticists who are part of that group. So what has that group been working on? Well, the first priority when we started was to say, well, we need a breeding goal so we can actually identify what it is we need. And as part of that, we did say that in the UK, we need to breed dairy cows which can thrive in a diverse UK dairy farming system. And I guess that is important when we talk about the fact that we have introduced a second index in the UK alongside PLI, because we do recognize that the systems are diverging. Uh, and I guess that does mean that there's a different type of cow needed in some of these systems. Also, I guess we were very um, aware that we really needed to show an improved health, welfare, and productivity of the dairy herd. And that's been at the forefront of our minds when we developed these indices. And really, I guess ultimately, it is because we are interested in profitability and, and environmental sustainability. A point I just want to point out, and I've made it earlier, is, is that really it's not a, a complete um, revamp. It's, uh, I think we build on the successes we've got to date. And so it's a fine tuning of the PLI. Uh, obviously, SCI, the spring calving index, is a new index. But the PLI evolves from the current PLI uh, with more emphasis on fitness traits. 
and more importantly also is that we w really wanted to maintain that milk quality. So fat and protein is still very important uh, and just as important as it was in the, the current PLI or the, the previous PLI, if you like. And the reason for that is really if we are interested in exporting or becoming an exporting market, we do know that it's not the liquid proportion that we're going to be exporting. And so fat and protein going forward and manufacturing, I guess, will be, will be key. That in the breeding world, we have got to be prepared for if we're breeding the cattle for, for 10 or 15 years from now. Some additional traits were added in the index. So calving is direct and maternal, uh, but also importantly is the maintenance cost, which we've now included for the first time. And I will talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. So the outcomes of the PLI, it's a reduced emphasis on production to now about a third of the overall PLI, a little bit less milk, uh, but I'll show you the impact of that later on, with maintaining the components, fat and protein. There is an increased emphasis on fertility, because we do know that farmers are still asking for an increased fertility of the, their cow. Uh, maintain the importance of longevity, that was already a strong feature in PLI. Increased emphasis on other health, because mastitis and somatic cell count is still a, a reason for culling, and we do want to improve that situation. Also an increased importance of functional type, because we also know that the cow needs to be built uh, to milk and to last, and food and legs and others are, are critical in that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, into including the cost of maintenance and calving yeast. But why do we include maintenance? And this is a, a, a busy slide. There's quite a lot of lines, and I'm not going to go into the details too much. But again, what I'm showing you here is the trends from insemination data that I showed you earlier for production traits and longevity and fertility between 95 and 2014. And really focusing on the, the four body traits, stature, chest, chest width, body depth, and angularity. And you can see that, in general, these trends have been going upwards, even though, and certainly in the, in the more recent years, when everybody um, is well, telling us that cows are getting too big and they're trying to select animals that are smaller, uh, we can still see that when we look at the stature line, which is a blue line here, we do still see an improvement and an increase in stature. Chest width um, is, is also increasing, so cows are getting wider. Body depth is kind of leveling off, but angularity, which is this purple line, is still increasing. With the consequence that really the live weight of our animals are getting bigger and bigger. And again, you see these significant drops in the spring calving herds who are, who are selecting a slightly different type of animal. But that is really a correlated response to our selection to date, and that is one that we want to hold, and we want to try and prevent cows getting bigger going forward. Why is it uh, important? And this is a, a study that Holston UK did, and I think it's a, a very interesting and very, very telling story when we look at how cows are being classified and then looking at the longevity of these animals. And for those who are less familiar with the scale, so it's a scale of 1 to 9 in the way these animals are being classified, with 1 being the, the very extreme, on the, uh, either on the, the shallow side or the coarse side when we talk about angularity, or narrow or very uh, small stature animals. With nine being the opposite of very deep animals, uh, very dairy animals, very tall or very wide. And you can see on farm, when these animals are being classified as, as heifers, uh, we do see that these are optimum traits. So correlating that back to the previous slides where I showed you that everything seems to be getting bigger and deeper and more angular, I think this is a, a concern that certainly we are interested in, in holding. Now moving from a, a phenotypic, so this is an observed scale that the classifiers of Holston UK are seeing on farm. When we actually look at the underlying genetics, the story is even more telling, and that's uh, probably a more negative trend where we actually see comparing now lifespan proofs on bulls versus the body traits. And I'm looking at reliable lifespan proofs of 49% or above, and bulls born, born in the last uh, well, 10 years or so in terms of proven bulls. And there we can see when we look at lifespan here on the, the x-axis, minus 0 0.8 being a very negative lifespan bulls and plus 0.8 being a very positive lifespan bulls. There's a very clear and strong correlation um, that we are we're seeing a negative trend in all of these traits where certainly the, the animals that are very tall, very deep, or very uh, angular are not the successful ones. And it's more these animals at the, the other end of the scale that we should be aiming for. Now, this is only one trade, and obviously it's a balance, because uh, some of these animals may not be as productive. So certainly when we're looking at PLI, it's trying to strike that balance, and not necessarily the smallest, but it's an animal that's efficient. And, and probably going forward in terms of PLI, it means we want to stop animals getting bigger where they are today, rather than necessarily trying to get them smaller. So the relative emphasis on PLI, and, and the, the, well, the digits aren't that important, but really it's showing you that we now have a, a lot of important components into the PLI index, 
uh, with production now about a third, and fertility and lifespan being significant factors in the, the overall index. Now the changes that we see in PLI, uh, comparing a new PLI versus the old PLI, is that the correlation is very strong, and it's over 90% correlation. So bulls really aren't going to re-rank dramatically. And there's, there's a lot of bulls that you recognize from before that still rank very well in the current PLI. But the thing that has changed is, is twofold. It's, uh, well, we do see that the scale is, is stretched out. This is the scale of the, the old PLI, whereas on the x-axis, we do see the scale of the new PLI. So it means that you really have to readjust uh, the type of bull you're interested in. And if previously you set yourself a target of about 100 PLI, that means in today's money, you should be looking more at 300, 250 to 300 PLI. Similarly, if you are focusing on 150, that's now equivalent to about 400 pounds PLI. So really, the bar in terms of PLI values, you've, you've got to lift in your mind when, you, when it comes to buying semen. Now, there are some bulls that do deviate more. Some go, um, go down or go up. And, and the reason for that is really because these are the bulls in particular. The very tall bulls are, are suffering a little bit in our new system where we do penalize bulls that throw heavy body weights or bulls that, that throw negative fertility. We also penalize in our system. So what did these two top 100 give? Well, comparing the April 14 uh, top 100 whole team bulls against the August 14 top 100 whole team bulls, there is a small drop in production. It's about a 70 kilogram drop in, in these top bulls. But as I said earlier, these bulls do maintain the component that there was certainly a very strong steer that the Genetic Advisory Forum gave uh, when we, we developed the, the PLI index. In terms of maintenance, well, you can see that there's a, a lower maintenance cost. We're looking for a smaller number when it comes to maintenance. And negative is good in terms of reducing maintenance cost. But you can also see that really what I showed you earlier is that we are not trying to breed small cows necessarily, because this number is still positive. Part of that is because a lot of these bulls are currently not being marketed. And I suspect going forward that AI companies will be seeking to, to introduce some of these, these smaller uh, bulls into our marketplace going forward. In terms of stature, we see an improvement, because these bulls are now more negative on somatic cell count. So we're improving somatic cell count. Lifespan has improved from 0.2 to 0.3. Our fertility index has also gone up from 4.5 to 6.3 in the top bulls. And also calving ease, direct and maternal, we see an improvement in calving ability. Then looking at the, the type traits of other composite has gone up, foot and leg composite has also gone up, and with the consequence that the overall type merit of the top 100 bulls as an average has also increased. Now, that information actually comes from the, the Derico website. And you can go to the Derico website to download it and, and look at the data in a bit more detail yourself. And also, what you can see, there's a lot of variation to choose from. Uh, certainly, even when we just thought about milk, uh, it ranges from about minus 100 kilograms of milk going up to about 950 kilograms of milk in these top 100 bulls. And I think that is important, that you really use PLI as a guide. And within that, you can then select your own emphasis on traits that are important, whether that's production or some of these fitness traits or type traits. Then we've also introduced a new index in August 2014, and that is our spring calving index. And it is a very different index. And I, I do want to emphasize the fact that it is very different, and the two should not be compared. Uh, the spring calving index is really targeting towards the spring calving herds who are block calving and make extensive use of grass, and are targeting about 4,500 kilograms of milk. A herd that is doing about 6,500 kilograms of grass with uh, some supplement feeding, uh, the spring calving index wouldn't be suitable for, because it probably wouldn't give enough credit to the production potential of bulls. Uh, in the spring calving index, we are looking at a very different type of animal than in a, a, a higher yielding uh, all year round calving or even autumn block calving herd. It is also a ranking across breeds, so it does mean that bulls from different breeds can be compared directly. And I think for this type of farm, uh, typically, there is more interest in crossbreeding. And that's also why we were very keen as a genetic advisory forum to make that in the crossbreed ranking. It's expressed on a crossbreed base. And that base is set at about a third Holstein and two thirds others. So we're really looking at a three-way cross, which includes Holstein and two other breeds. All of that doesn't mean that the figures that are being expressed in the spring calving index cannot be compared against the PLI breed average. And I've made it in bold and, and have underlined the fact. And I'm not quite sure how I can emphasize that fact more. But really, don't, don't ever compare these, these figures, because they are very different. And it probably only confuse you. So the SCI, well, in, this, in essence, I think a lot of the, the things are happening in spring calving index that we do also do in PLI. Again, we focus on milk quality a little bit more probably in the spring calving index, or actually significantly more. Um, 
but production is still important, uh, but it's components based rather than, than liquid. Obviously, there is a strong emphasis on fertility because block calving herds are um, in need of good fertility figures, and, and certainly that will come through in the top bulls on the SDI ranking. Cost of maintenance is critically important. I think in this, this particular system, uh, the smaller cow and a higher stocking density is, is critical, and really it does mean that we are really emphasizing bulls that throwing smaller daughters. Other health is still important, as are the calving difficulties, but longevity, obviously, and we do also protect functional type in these, these herds. Similar sort of pie chart as you've seen before, um, with similar sort of emphasis. Uh, fertility is slightly more, as you would expect, in production traits, although it does seem high. It's, it is much more component-based than, than uh, we see in the PLI index. So what did the top 100 SCI bulls deliver? And this is, remember, an across-breed index. So we're now looking not just at Holstein bulls, as we showed you earlier, but this now includes um, all the active bulls that we've got. And the active bull list at the moment includes the, the red cattle, the Ayrshires and, and some of the Scandinavian breeds, the Holsteins, the Frisians, the Jerseys, and the Brown Swiss. And really what we see there is that the, the milk production is lower, uh, but we are emphasizing more the components. Maintenance cost is now a, a strong negative, so we're certainly looking now for a much smaller animal uh, than we were in the PLI index, but still, still strong showing for the fitness traits and also good functional type going forward. Now some of that data, uh, again, comes from the Dairy Co. website, and I'll just show you uh, quickly where you can find that information. So if you go to www.dairycobreeding.org.uk, on the website we've now developed two different sections, uh, very specifically one for PLI and one for the Spring Calving Index. In our PLI one, you can still see the traditional that you've been used to when you've come to our site before. It gives you an explanation of PLI and who should be using PLI. And within that, you can look for the, the breed of choice to really um, well, look at the bulls that are being actively marketed in the UK. But just going back to the home page again, because we're going to look at spring calving index in this instance. Um, here, again, a little bit of an explanation of spring calving index. And when we click on the SCI bull list, uh, we then can see our available daughter proofs, uh, but also our genomic young stars ranked on SCI. Now that list again gives us the across breed ranking, so it does include the Jersey bulls here at the top with some Holstein mixed in, and Frisians and Ayrshires as we go uh, down the ranking. And that information is really now there to, to allow you to, uh, to search the bull that's of interest for you in, in your mating system. You can also download it into Excel, and I've, I've just made that um, earlier. And really the reason for it is to illustrate you, I guess, well, what type of animals and what type of breeds are coming through in these rankings. So this is a stay, the same list that I've just downloaded into Excel uh, using the download function on the website. And I've just highlighted different breeds to illustrate, I guess, what is going on. These are ranked now in SCI order, with our orange animals being our Jersey bulls, the white ones being the Holstein, then we've got our Frisians, and then we've got our red breeds and, and brown Swiss. Now, as you scroll down the rankings, you can see that there's a, a good mixture of different breeds coming through. And, and really, I guess it emphasizes that we're not just saying just use one breed over another. Uh, it's really the variation there that now exists that allows you to make that choice between the different breeds. And although there's a, a lot of Jersey bulls at the top, certainly further down, you can see there's a lot of uh, choice out there. Now, what that allows you to do is certainly in a three-way cross to say, well, what is it that we're going to emphasize in this mating season? If, and if production is going to be uh, the trait of choice, um, you can re-rank the list in, in milk, and obviously, as you would expect, we get our uh, Holstein's bulls showing up there. Uh, or you can re-rank them in fat percent order, where, not surprisingly, the jerseys would come through. Uh, for somatic cell count, a similar sort of story. Uh, again, you see variation coming through, but the Holstein's in, in general will come out. Re-ranking on, on longevity, again, a mixture of breeds that's so not not necessarily, again, as I said earlier, that we're promoting one breed over another. It really depends on the trait of interest you're looking for. And then finally, just to illustrate again what, what would happen when we rank them on fertility index, um, we find that, again, not surprisingly, I guess, that the Frisians and, and some of the Norwegian reds are coming to the top mixed in with some Holsteins. So I've, I've shown you, I guess, what is possible and how you can use this type of information and in any given situation when it now comes to finding the right type of bull for your, your mating season, uh, please do look at this information and use it correctly uh, in terms of identifying the bulls that are going to make you the most profit.
So really, uh, two slides to summarize what I've said so far. Uh, this one is more to do with, well, how, how you go about, I guess, raising your herd profitability through better breeding. It is important that every herd set their own realistic breeding goal and not just rely on what is being promoted by the AI companies or what's the hot sire at the moment. Uh, every herd has got different strengths and weaknesses, and I think it is important that you do recognize your own strengths and weaknesses and, and, and critically make use of benchmarking tools that are out there to help you doing that job. And I'm just going to highlight the Dairy Co-Herd Genetic Report, which is an online uh, report you can log into if you're a milk recording herd, which will in, in one sheet highlight to you which of the genetic areas should take more improvement, whether it's production traits or, or some of the fitness traits. Uh, and it is an easy to use guide and we are now also working with um, vets and other consultants who use it for their clients to improve the genetics on farm. Also then understanding how you use the tools available to you and I've talked about PLI and SCI and these are now new tools that, that certainly will make your life easier I would hope. Uh, we haven't talked about genomics tonight but I do believe that that is another strong feature that certainly everybody should be aware of and should be interested in. Uh, I know that it currently it's only available in Holstein, but there are other breeds that we are working on and hope to, to have genomic figures for in the future. Certainly there is a bull that suits every system, and making the right uh, choice is important for your own system. So in summary, uh, I've shown you we have made very favorable genetic progress in the UK already for most major traits. The body size uh, has been increasing, and that is a concern that we're now addressing in the new PLI and spring calving index. And as I showed you, within the PLI, we're not necessarily looking for a small animal, uh, but we're hoping to, to at least hold that increase that we've seen in the past. In August 2014, then, we've seen that revised PLI with increased emphasis on fitness traits and including that maintenance cost. We've also introduced a spring calving index, which we hope will help the farmers that are specifically on the spring block calving system and currently had to look abroad uh, for an index that perhaps suited their need. Now that we've got a UK index, which is specifically set up for UK cost and UK um, outputs, I think that is going to be a much better choice. And we know from, from historic uh, analysis that having a specific index targeted and specifically made up for the UK is much, much better than trying to rely on a foreign index, which may mimic what we're trying to do. But it is important, as I said earlier, that it really is only for farmers that are targeting that 4,500, 5,000-liter uh, average per year. Anybody really targeting a higher yield of grass should be looking at the PLI index. We have also had a base change in August, and I'm not going to go into detail tonight, uh, but there is information again on the Dairy Co website where you will see some of the base changes that, that we've introduced. More fact sheets are available which explain the updates. Um, and really, I guess what, what it is showing that is we've now got some improved tools available to build on the success of the past. And it is important that I think we recognize that we've done a very good job and now we're just fine-tuning going forward and making sure we, we're hitting the target. Ultimately, um, I do believe that this is going to be good for the cow because uh, we are improving our fitness traits, and uh, that also does result in better profitability on farm. Uh, but also, importantly, I think it sends a strong signal to our consumer, who is also very aware of our genetics, uh, that we are looking after the cow and are very keen to make sure that that continues in the future. <coughs> 